all, there's just a few more articles I want to get through before I will eventually do a comments video. I, I'm aware it's taking me some time, do bear with me, and also I'm quite busy and, you know, things getting away, but I, it, is, it is at the forefront of my mind, so, um, because, uh, you know, I've got, I would like to go back over your comments at some point and properly, you know, that is going to happen, it's just it might take me a bit of time because of everything else getting in the way, um, and there's still quite a few articles I want to get through, um, but it means there will always be stuff to talk about on this channel, which is good. Um, so, in my previous video, um, I was discussing the, um, the whole sort of diagnosis around autism, and um, it was an article about the social process of diagnosis, and um, I pretty much covered it all, but um, I, I wanted to just finish it off from where I left off in the last video. Um, so I finished off at the point where I was talking about how people can show traits of autism without necessarily meeting a full diagnosis. That's where I, I, I stopped. And I think that's a really important thing to, to consider, is that, like, autism, in t if the actual cutoff of autism, like, where, where do these traits become autism and where are they just natural variation? is a moving feast, essentially. Um, in the DSM, it says, it, it says that the traits must cause clinically significant impairment um, in occupational, social and other areas of functioning, something like that. Clinically significant impairment is the key um, thing to consider. Um, it's not enough just to have traits, they have to be causing significant problems. The question, of course, is how do you ascertain that these are clinically significantly impairing? And that largely does rest on the subjective clinical judgement of the clinician. Um, obviously, in very extreme cases, where it is clearly causing impairment, it is a very easy judgment call like there's no question it's causing impairment this person is obviously handicapped disabled they the, the, you know they're over the threshold the traits are really significantly impairing them they're autistic and then you'll find great deal of consensus among clinicians it gets more complicated at the kind of borderline areas where it is not clear that the person is clinically significantly impaired and then you might find greater degree of um, uh, inconsistency. I mean, clinicians will vary in whether or not they think this person is clinically significantly impaired, and a person, and and yeah, so you're likely going to find some say yes, some say no. It is not so clear cut. And it's at those boundary lines where you find the greatest um, amount of uh, um, philosophical subjectivity, I guess. Is it awesome? Is it not? Very much a judgment call. And then, like I was saying in my previous video, it that some clinicians will draw heavily on a criteria-led judgment. Um, and they're more likely to say no. Others, um, you know, if it's not clear that the person is clinically significantly impaired, some will, some will be quite conservative in their judgments and will say no. Um, they're not impaired enough. Another clinician might say, actually, this person does have quite a number of needs. It's not clear that they're autistic, but because they still have enough needs, they're going to err on the side of caution and give them that diagnosis anyway. The problem is, of course, um, that obviously there is no blood test for autism, there's no biological marker. So it is very much a moving feast at this borderline area. Um, and that's where the concept of autism as a dimension comes in, um, or rather the traits being dimensional. I would say, yes, the traits are dimensional to a point. Um, in a sense that through the general population you're going to find people who have more who are more or less good at social skills. Some people are going to be really good at social skills, 
other people are going to struggle with social skills to a greater or lesser extent. Most of those people will not be will not struggle to such an extent that they're significantly impaired by them. But it's a it's a kind of like a sort of natural kind of variation, a bell curve. When you get to the extremes of a bell curve, that is when those straight those traits start to cause problems. And that is when a person might be diagnosed with something. It might be awesome, it might be ADHD. Um, it's when the traits start to cause problems. Um, why is it goes very extreme? So I'll say I compare it a little bit to height. I think I've talked about this before. Height is dimensional. Um, it's not usually the case that someone is absolutely tall or absolutely short. You can only ever say someone is more or less tall, more or less short. But when you get to the very, very extremes of height, when someone is really tall, it's not much. It's not very likely that someone else is going to be much taller than them. There still will be some relativity involved. Like someone might be really tall again, you might find find someone else who's a little bit taller than them. But at the very extremes of height, it becomes more absolute. And also at that extreme of height, the person is likely going to have some disorder because it's not normal to be extremely, extremely tall. Indeed, those people do often have back problems, heart problems, and other things. And often they do have a syndrome. There are a number of syndromes that can make someone extremely tall. And likewise, extremely short people often have some medical condition. Um, yeah, where I think is it like, I don't know if that term is still in use or if it's offensive or not. So in inverted commas, so it's, I don't want to offend anyone, but I think what used to be called congenital dwarfism, whether it's still called dwarfism, I don't really know. So I, sorry if I'm using a term that's now offensive, I don't mean to. But that's that's an example where you would end up with like a um, yeah like a congenital problem where it is no longer just like being a little bit short, you know. It's an actual, it's a clinical condition. You either are or you're not sort of thing um, because it's at the point where the person is actually over the line into some condition territory. So height is both dimensional, but it's all, but at the extremes you end up with categories where a person has a condition. And I'll say autism is a bit like that, although obviously autism is more complicated because it's not just one dimension, it's many different dimensions. But these dimensions do run through the general population. But I would say it's only where the person has loads and loads of traits that are beginning to be quite intense that it makes sense to describe them as having autistic traits. But not all people with autistic traits... So obviously not all people in the general population have autistic traits, even though they might... Even though, obviously, these traits are still human, and to a lesser extent, everyone has the traits, because autism traits are human traits. But not, all, not everyone has autistic traits, because I would say they only become autistic traits when they're, like, really intense, and maybe causing a person slightly more difficulty in life. But even if they're causing slightly more difficulty in life, it doesn't mean a person is necessarily clinically significantly impaired by them. I would describe my brother as someone who, and he himself has actually admitted it, as having a high number of autistic traits. Um... He is exhausted by social situations, He's, he likes repetition, um, and I can definitely see quite a number of traits that I have in him, in, but, to, to, but that aren't disabling him, essentially. And that is the difference, they do not disable him. He is not impaired, he functions perfectly fine, he's not at all disabled, so he's not autistic. But I can definitely see that he does have autistic traits, because he has these traits to quite a high extent, and they are maybe more intense than your average person. But he's not impaired by them, he's not autistic. Okay, and I think with my, and I think that's quite clear. I guess it does become a bit more complicated though when a person has a large number of autistic traits, um, but is actually experiencing mental health difficulties that can be directly related to those traits. Do you diagnose them as autistic? Are they clinically significantly impaired enough? That's a judgment call. So in this um, in this article, <laughs> um, so to carry on discussing this article, it also mentions women. And how um, di apparently diagnosing women is partic particularly problematic um, with because there's a common view that they have learned to manage their difficulties and so they have developed effective social skills. I personally am a bit sceptical of that claim as a woman myself. <laughs> um, I do not, I think that there's this whole, in a way, we, we risk creating a new stereotype and a new myth that somehow women. Um, are just better at social skills and I think this feeds into the whole general sexist idea that women are better at social skills than men. Now I'm not denying 
that there aren't differences between men and women. There are. It's obvious to see. And I and I'm not denying that there aren't social in sorry social um, influences behind say how men and women interact. And on average, women do interact a bit differently than men. I'm not denying that at all. I do think it is mainly society more than biology. I'm not denying biological influences either, by the way. I'm just saying I think it's mainly society. Um, that obviously women are, are um, educated from a young age to be behave more social than boys. And you see this played out in playgrounds and stuff like that from quite a young age. Um, I'm not denying the differences, okay? What I am saying is that we have to be very careful about reifying um, largely socially constructed differences into something that we see as kind of um, embedded and then making sweeping assumptions about um, men and women, girls and boys, creating new stereotypes along the way, um, instead of challenging um, how men and women interact and looking at the social forces behind it. Um, when it comes to autism, I think it's more likely uh, that people don't expect to see autism in girls and women. There's confirmation bias explained away women and girls' characteristics differently. Oh, she's a bit shy, she's not very confident, even if she's showing exactly the same traits as boys. I'd also say, by the way, that in autism, you're actually less likely to be socially influenced by gender norms um, because you're in your own little world more. So actually, it's likely that girls, that autistic girls are going to be a bit less different to autistic boys than you'd find in a general population between men and women, boys and girls. Um, personally, myself, I don't feel that influenced by gender norms. I do stuff that some people in society might see as more masculine traits, like I'm very assertive, I'm very outspoken, a lot of people see us as quite masculine type traits, um, and I think that might be because I haven't really been influenced by gender conditioning, I'm too much in my own world, I can't get into trouble like that, um, but in some ways you could argue it's a good thing in a way. Um, I'm not saying I'm not influenced by gender norms, <laughs> I probably am in some unconscious ways, we don't know to what extent we are to some extent, you know, a lot of it is unconscious, I'm just saying I don't think I'm as influenced as many women, and that probably is to do with autism, um, but I, don't, I just don't go along with the crowd, it doesn't really affect me, um, I do my own thing, um, if I'm interested in, like, I can get really geeky about a particular interest people don't consider as female, I don't care, because I'm interested in whatever, like, I don't follow the crowd, I just do my own thing. But anyway, um, sorry, what am I trying to say? Um, but yeah, I just don't agree, I don't buy into this idea that women have developed more effective social skills than men, I certainly haven't. Like, hell man, I don't even know how to make proper friends, I haven't even had a normal relationship. Am I the exception? I don't think I am. Um, I do think that we're seeing more and more new age autistics getting diagnosed. A lot of them are women who, in my view, probably would not have met the criteria if they're being assessed a bit more rigorously. I think a lot of them just aren't clinically impaired. People like Melanie Sykes and Christine McGuinness, I, I, I'm stating my views, I'm stating my mind. I really do not see autism in them. Like, yes, they have traits, but I think they're a bit more like my brother. And I know Christine McGuinness definitely had mental health problems. But I think she's more along the lines of autistic personality. I just don't really see them as having proper autism. So people like that are now getting diagnosed. I think they're actually kind of skewing the figures a little bit and making it seem as though women are more social than they actually are. Anyway, moving over to video number two now because I am waffling. Okay, moving over to video number two now.